we have uh, Jeremy Epstein, who's uh, no stranger to blockchain. A lot of you may have already heard about him and heard him speak at other conferences. He's one of the leading marketeers of blockchain technology, has been helping a lot of startups uh, as a consultant, and uh, has an illustrious 20-year career in marketing. So, Jeremy. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's been a long day. Thank goodness for the rain that keeps you here, so I have your attention, captive audience. Uh, the absolute worst position, of course, to be in is being the guy standing between all of you in happy hours, so I'm gonna try to keep that in mind. Um, wanted to do a quick thank you guys, to especially IAB Tech Lab and all the panelists and all the presenters today. It's been fantastic to really understand that. Just a quick uh, bio on me. Most recently, <clears throat> I was uh, head of marketing at a company called Sprinkler, uh, which is, uh, I like to say, the leading enterprise social media management uh, platform in the world. I joined the company when there were about 30 people. Uh, we had just done our Series A $20 million valuation, uh, and I had that position until we were about 1,400 people, 1.8 billion uh, valuations. So that was obviously a very interesting ride. And about two years ago, I went into crypto uh, full time and uh, been doing it ever since. I bought my first Bitcoins when Bitcoin was about $80, like everybody else, didn't buy enough, sold too early. Uh, but that's where I got the first crypto bug, but my uh, all-in moment was around Bitcoin 400 is where I said this is what I'm going to do. I remember sitting with my finger over the Coinbase, uh, for, over the enter button on Coinbase for like 20 minutes thinking my wife's going to kill me. I'm never going to see this money again, but it just makes so much damn sense. So uh, let's take a look at that. So uh, the journey that I've taken through crypto I think is very similar to a lot of people where you start off with this Oh my, oh my God, crypto is just out of control. I can't quite get my head around this. Uh, you, you fall down the proverbial rabbit hole and then you have this moment of nirvana where you're like, oh yes, I totally understand it. And then in a split second, it's gone and then you're back on the holy shit, uh, I know nothing. Thank you for nodding. It makes me feel like uh, I'm not alone in that particular journey. So I'm gonna do what I can to share with you what it was that I think I experienced at that split second of enlightenment at the top of that curve, but please keep in mind that I'm fully aware that I really have no idea what I'm talking about. So uh, let's keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, as I got into crypto, um, I started to think about sort of uh, the, the massive evolutions in marketing that I've seen uh, over the course of my life and as a history major over the course uh, of history, and my thinking has really been informed by this excellent book by Tim Wu, who's a law professor at Columbia, uh, called The Attention Merchants. And obviously, uh, you guys are all in the business of attention, and in fact, excuse me, I'm pretty sure that almost everybody in the room here knows more about the advertising business uh, than I do. I look at it, obviously, from sort of the CMO perspective, but uh, have enough to, uh, to, to definitely be dangerous. But I think what Wu helped me understand is that, you know, there's sort of this uh, eternal marketing elements. I call it Peter Drucker marketing, the stuff that you just hasn't changed since we've been painting on the walls of caves. You know, it's you know your customer, value proposition, basic stuff like that. But what happens is, is every time a new technology comes onto the scene, it fundamentally changes the execution uh, of marketing. So if you think back to the 1850s here in New York with the advent of the penny papers, you know, that brought reach and advertising as we know it into its form. Radio makes uh, marketing sort of an auditory experience. TV makes it visual. Internet makes it faster. Social makes it two-way. Mobile makes it location independent, as we all know. So I saw this blockchain thing coming, and when I had my oh my god moment, I was like, wow, this thing's a tsunami. That reminds me of when I was a much younger man here in New York in the late 90s, right in the middle of dot com, and then again in social media, and I was like, okay, this thing's huge. All the other ones have affected marketing. What's going to happen when this tidal wave of change that is blockchain and crypto and decentralization slams into marketing, which has been changed by all these other forces in the past? And that's what I've been exploring um, from an intellectual perspective over the last two years. Um, as, as was mentioned, the bulk of my work is, is, is deep in the world of crypto, uh, advising you know, top 100, 150 coins in the world like uh, Zcash, Salt, 
Uh, so take a picture and tweet it to them. So I show them I'm wearing the flag. Uh, Arc, Open Bazaar, Storage, uh, people like that. So I started to explore uh, all of that. And then they said, OK, let's take a step back. And let's think about what is the problem that marketers have. The fundamental problem is nobody thinks we know what we're doing. Nobody. All right, that's not true. Most people don't think uh, we know what we're doing. There was a stat in HBR back in June that said 80% of Fortune 1000 CEOs don't have confidence in their chief marketing officer. Now imagine you're the CMO of a Fortune 1000 brand. You walk into the office on Monday and you're like, there's an 80% chance you think I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, how's that for company morale? So that's a big problem we all have. Now I look at blockchain and we've been talking about it all day. And now again, you guys know more about the ins and outs of DSPs and DMPs and SSPs and all that stuff than I do. But I look at that ecosystem and I say, wow, there are the brands over here. There are the publishers over here, and there's this huge mess in the middle that's just chock full of intermediaries, lacking transparency. You know, I've seen numbers anywhere from 30% to 60% of money that just gets wasted. We know about transparency. We know about fraud. We know all those problems. And you say, wow, this industry just has blockchain written all over it. We had a really healthy panel debate this morning that I thought was really fascinating, but to me, it's so reminiscent of the early stages of this evolution that it almost doesn't matter who's right in terms of what the particular implementation is. It's just that these two things just seem destined for each other. And that's the hypothesis that I'm operating under. So if I'm a CMO of a big company or a CMO of any company, I'm saying, OK, we've got this new technology that affords transparency, that affords immutability, that affords all types of opportunities for uh, better uh, um, uh, um, you know, record keeping and all the things that we know about blockchain. It's okay, what are the things that I can bring to bear so that my CEO, I move from that 80% of us, 80% of you think I stink down to like only 40%. That would be great, you know, 50% improvement. And I say, first of all, we can increase our total addressable market. Why? Because in a crypto world, in a blockchain world, you don't actually have to verify someone's credit. You just look in their wallet. You look in this smart contract. Yes, the money's there, number one. Number two, lower customer acquisition costs. Now, if you have better data, that you have confidence in that origin of the data, then you can start making better decisions. I remember in my days leading marketing, we'd get all, I'd get all these spreadsheets that come up to me, and I'd be like, how do I know this hasn't been massaged by my agency or one of the people on my staff to make it look a little bit better? Well, now we have these sort of blockchain-based proofs. We have a better idea that the actually the data is accurate, which can make better decisions, which can lower customer acquisition costs, as well as give us the opportunity for all the reasons we've been talking about today about lower marketing expenses. And most importantly, from a brand perspective, gives us the opportunity to build trust. Now, the good news is when I started thinking about this, uh, I realized I wasn't alone, and I was able to talk with uh, a guy who has a great first name um, at the CMO of NASDAQ, as well as the CMO of Dun & Bradstreet, both of whom said, yep, Jeremy, you are on to something. We also agree that the blockchain, and, and this was a year and a half ago when they made these quotes, uh, is something that I think that CMOs are going to want <clears throat> to jump on. So I said, okay, great, I'm headed down the right path, or at least I think that I am. So the first thing I said is, okay, the marketing as a, as a discipline is going to evolve as this technology hits. Then I said, okay, let's look at what I call blockchain marketing technology. Now, many of you have seen Scott Brinker's famous MarTech 5000. It's now like MarTech 7827 or something like that, which he sort of puts out every year with all the companies in the SaaS space and even some on-prem that sort of solve or address the marketing uh, you know, the, the needs of marketers. And one thing we know about marketers, in order for you to do, or in order for them to do their job at scale, they need technology. So I said, wait a second. All of these companies, including people like Sprinkler, are basically centralized entities where the value is captured in SaaS platforms. So if blockchain allows for the decentralization of these technologies and the tokenization, the distribution of this value out to the network, then it stands to reason that theoretically, um, these MarTech companies should be decentralized in some form or fashion. So I said, well, I'm going to take that whole thing and I'm going to start tracking the, block the blockchain MarTech. So back in September last year, we did our very first ever blockchain 
MarTech landscape. Now, I will be the first to admit that our categories are not perfect and some of the projects here maybe you could definitely argue with for sure. But conceptually, we said, well, okay, like, you know, a, a uh, Civic, who we had a great presentation uh, from before, thank you. You know, I could see Civic as replacing a CRM. Like, why would you need a CRM system if you have Civic, right? So you could say, okay, that's kind of clearly all the advertising here. And one of the things I pointed out is uh, I wasn't the only person who realized that the advertising uh, market was the one that was most ripe for disruption. And when you looked at the landscape, that was obviously where the heaviest concentration was. So this was back in um, uh, September of last year. I think we had, you know, 20 some that I had found. Fast forward to version two which we did in, in February, and we saw a 400% growth in the number of projects that I would consider, that we considered to be blockchain MarTech. Now we're doing version threes coming out uh, all after Labor Day, and we're already on track for at least 100% growth, probably more once we dig uh, and we find out everybody uh, on there. So, and if you are a blockchain MarTech company or an ad tech company, please make sure that you go fill out the form and profile yourself, because one of the things that's ironic about these is we have a hard time finding them, and we're one of the few people on the planet actually looking for you. So you should definitely, um, if we don't find you, then you definitely have a marketing problem, but we'll talk about that later. So. Obviously, we're seeing growth across the board. Uh, you guys all know the story, sort of, in what's happened in the last year in, in crypto or so. Uh, in terms of the explosion, we've heard from some of the leaders uh, today. The panel today was obviously great uh, in that respect. And then there's this emergence, what I call crypto native marketing tools, an entirely new category. Today, we spent a lot of time talking about technologies that are either going to replace or sort of augment existing systems. But we're starting to see the emergence of entirely new marketing tools that previously didn't exist. So imagine, for example, if you want to manage 55 Ethereum name services, uh, Ethereum names using ENS auction mechanisms for various brands, Nike football, Nike basketball, Nike golf, and you need to manage all of that uh, on Ethereum, you need a tool to do that. You know, analyzing encrypted data. One of them, ones that I work with, I'm disclosure, I'm an advisor for them is Endor. They do. Um, predictive analytics on encrypted blockchain data, specifically on the Ethereum blockchain to determine how wallets are going to behave. It's almost the first uh, iteration of like wallet relationship management replacing CRM. So you're going to see an entirely, I believe, we're already starting to see it, a, a, an entirely new class. Just like 10 or 15 years ago, you didn't need a sprinkler. 25 years ago, Salesforce didn't exist, but yet here they all are. You didn't need a mobile, man, a mobile marketing suite. You didn't need all that, but now you have it. I predict, and we're already starting to see, that you're going to have more and more of that. So it's really exciting to see not only how we're going to improve the existing systems that we have, which we've spent a lot of time talking about, but I also think we're going to see an entirely new suite of tools that um, uh, emerge specifically for sort of the crypto native or crypto first uh, companies out there. So you'll see these types of things where we take these uh, traditional enterprise or SaaS based systems and we decentralize them. And that's example what Endor is doing with their prediction uh, protocol. Uh, we don't need to spend too much time talking about what's happening in terms of enterprise growth. Everybody's seeing that here and it's really, really great to see. When I started this journey two years ago, uh, like we talked about, I probably would have been the only, I was the only person talking about the emergence, emergence, emergence of blockchain and marketing. I had people telling me, uh, A, you're too early, B, no one's going to care, C, it's just not going to happen. And so it's really validating. Thank you guys for making me feel good. My wife will be happy. No, I'm not totally crazy uh, that we're doing that. So it's very kind of cool to see what's happening. And as the momentum picks up um, with you know people like Nyax and all the other guys leading the charge. So we've seen marketing evolve. We've seen block, blockchain MarTech evolve, and now I think we're starting to see the evolution of markets. And one of the things that I go, and I spend a lot of time talking to Fortune 1000 audiences, uh, I'm the marketing faculty member for uh, Don Tapscott's Blockchain Research Institute, so I get an opportunity to talk to you know, the, the blockchain leaders at the Fortune, you know, all these companies. And I say to them, guys, this isn't sort of little things here and there, it's happening in every single industry. Pick an industry, and there is somebody trying to decentralize it. There is somebody trying to take a crypto token based approach to this particular issue. Now, I'm not saying that mainframe is going to beat Slack or Gladius is going to beat Cloudflare or any of these things. What I am saying is that there are enough people going after this because they see the opportunity. And so you have to understand this is, I tell people it's like the, the technological maturity 
of internet circa 1994 at the speed of internet 1999. And that's the part that's hard to get the head around because whereas in 1999, uh, when we had the dot com, it was primarily a US phenomenon. You needed a, a brokerage account, which meant you needed a certain amount of money. Those of you who remember back in those days, it's not like we had broadband to the house. You still had dial up. It was pretty easy. Now you need a phone. You don't really need any, there are basically no barriers to entry. It's 24 seven and it's global. So this fits directly into Tom Friedman, what he calls the age of acceleration the thesis, where each layer of technology makes the subsequent layer of technology's adoption faster. So the commercial internet, for example, took 20 years. You know, 10 years ago, Jobs introduces the smartphone. Everyone's like, I don't really need it. Now you'd rather cut off your arm than give away your smartphone. You know, social media, what have you. So I think that's where, you know, I tell people crypto is probably not going to get here full on as quickly as I think it will, but it's going to be a hell of a lot faster than you think it will. <laughs> you know, so that's what I'm really, really tracking, and I think it's just really fascinating to see. So while I agree with a lot of the comments earlier throughout the day that, you know, it's not ready for prime time, it's difficult to use and all that for sure, uh, given what's happening, how, how many smart people there are, how much money's in the space, all the people are, all the brain power that's coming into the space, uh, I just feel like, and I've seen already within the past two years, how quickly these cycles are and how, how much better things are getting. Like the Augur app, for example, that came out this week. Uh, you know, I remember when they first did their early beta, it was a total crap, you know, nothing. Now they had a million dollars of bets basically going through. One of my friends just made $7,000 on the World Cup the other day, so he's pretty happy about that. Okay. So then if you take a step back and you say, look, I'm a marketer and I'm working in a traditional uh, um, you know, marketing environment, what does all this mean for me? You know, 10 years ago when I started talking about social media, I said, well, you know, it's going to change uh, marketing from a broadcast function to a two-way conversation function, right? Today, it's obvious. We all know that 10 years ago, people thought I was insane. So, uh, you know, luckily, maybe I wasn't, maybe I got lucky, you know, once you're lucky, twice you're good. So we'll take a shot on this one. Here's what I think is going to happen for marketers as blockchain starts hitting sort of more mainstream. Um, obviously, again, you guys know all of it. At the end of the day, if you're a CMO, if you're a CEO, whatever, the, the most important thing is advertising becomes more accountable. It becomes more accountable on transparency. It becomes more accountable on risk. There was a great interview or a profile of Mark Pritchard, the CMO of Procter & Gamble, maybe like two or three months ago in the Wall Street Journal. And um, he said, he, he just, it was, the, it was like the day after he cut, you know, digital ad spend by $200 million. And he started, he did, a li he, did a, he did a list of all the things that he had a problem with when it came to the existing digital advertising ecosystem. And I read that and I was like, wow. Mark Pritchard basically just wrote a requirements document for a blockchain-based advertising solution. He just doesn't know it yet. You know, and that's basically what he's demanding, and he's out in the charge of doing that. Uh, sorry for all the other vendors in the room, but I threw the bat one out there because the, the basic attention, Toge and Brave, uh, because it's just simple. But I think you're going to start seeing, and, and it's really amazing to see all the different perspectives. And I don't know who's going to win, and I almost don't even care who wins. I think what's important is that somebody wins, and all the different innovations and all different efforts that people are trying to uh, make things uh, work. So we're going to get more accountability. We're going to get more transparency. And I think ultimately uh, we're going to have that. We talked about Mark Goldman brought up today about uh, you know, trading attention. That's where Tim Wu's thesis is. Uh, that's what basic attention token is. That's the business that everyone's in, is how do we get people's attention? It's that one commodity that none of us have more of that's a continually inspiring asset. Um, there's a really funny story here. There's a guy who's on the extended Never Stop Marketing team here named Carlos. He read my book where I talked about how uh, I thought we would move to this world where people were paying for attention. And like many of you, I get you know 10 to 20 sort of random LinkedIn outreaches per day. And you're like, why are you reaching out to me? But if you want to read my stuff, that's fine. You can do that. Carlos goes to earn.com, contacts me for a buck. <laughs> I'm cheap. And uh, I'm, I'm cost effective. And uh, sends me a note. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bargain. That's what I, I, I deliver high value for. That's what I'm trying to say. It's late in the day. Um, and he sends me the note, and I was like, all right, this is a guy who understands that other people's time has value, other people's attention has value. And because of that, now he's working together and he's building out our training module to help people become certified crypto marketers, 
with a non-fungible ERC721 ERC token as proof of having completed the course. So you'll see that that'll be your new credential going into the next world. So I'm cheap, Naval's a little bit more expensive, and if you want a guaranteed response from Mark Andreessen, it's only gonna cost you a hundred bucks. But to me, this is the world we're all gonna be moving into, whereas marketers, we ha will have the, the choice on an on a individual level, and somebody on the last panel was just talking about having those non-sketchy sort of personal relationships. This is a non-sketchy personal relationship where the brand has an opportunity to say to the customer, to the prospect, yes, I value you, I value your time, I value your attention, I'm gonna pay you for it. And you can make those individual decisions along the way, and I think that's gonna be really, really powerful. And once we start getting people saying, wait, it's like I could go over here and have my attention abused, or I can go over here and get paid for my attention, pretty soon when that starts happening, and this was validated by the fact that Coinbase bought them, you know, I think that's a pretty interesting sort of transition that we're gonna start to witness. So advertising, you guys understand that. The other one I'm really, or another one I'm really fascinating on two levels is loyalty. So all these loyalty points, you know, I'm 1K on United, I'm Marriott Gold, whatever, but they're stuck in these silos. Why? They shouldn't be. Those are valuable assets that I should be able to trade, I should be able to, you know, redeem, what have you. So I think we're gonna start seeing uh, forward-thinking brands who say, wait, there's an opportunity for me to move from loyalty as like this lock-in mentality to what I, you know, in my kitschy moments call like customer loving. How do I use loyalty as something that I can then reward, uh, I can use those points to reward people and turn my customers into my most valuable sort of customer acquisition channel. I can use my loyalty points, give you a free seat on United, and you're like, this is awesome. I mean, in theory, if United's flights were awesome, that would work. But, you know, they're, they're not bad. Like, they generally get you where you're going. But, you know, I can use that, and, and basically you incentivize those, the edges of the network to do the marketing, which is the best way to do it anyway, right? It's word of mouth with sort of an economic incentive package on top of it. So I think you'll start seeing companies do that. In fact, Rakuten's doing exactly that. They're trying to break down the silos across their various loyalty point programs, which they have in like, I'm making numbers up, somewhere between nine and 15 different Asian countries, but each one until, uh, still today, I mean, they haven't done it yet, but they're about to, excuse me, um, that you could only redeem your loyalty points in Japan for Japanese stuff, in Singapore, what have you. Now they're saying, wait a second, we should just be able to use my Japanese loyal, uh, the, the loyalty points that I acquire or accrue in Japan, I should be able to redeem in Singapore, why not? And that creates a, a more valuable economy for Rakuten. So I think you'll see that. The other part of this that I think is really interesting when you talk about crypto native projects, so I don't mean to yell or whatever, get stupid. I just get really excited about this. My wife's always like, why are you yelling? I'm just like, dude, this is amazing. This is awesome. And my kid's future depends on it. So I have to really convince you that it's about to work. Um, so I think when it comes to crypto projects in particular, there's a really interesting angle for loyalty where it, it actually um, is going to be a make or break thing because the switching costs between, between moving protocols or moving sort of uh, applications is relatively low, right? So I, can, I tell people, you know, I can move my Bitcoin wallet from JAX to blockchain.info or whatever in like 40 seconds. Good luck doing with that chase or city. But in order for me to stay on a given app or stay within a given protocol, there's got to be a loyalty component. So I think you're going to start, and you see that even with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, that... Um, people are going to have a, an emotional component beyond just the functionality. Thing. So I think loyalty is going to be a really interesting one. And the loyalty, the way we think about loyalty in a crypto first world, which admittedly is not going to be here on Monday, um, is something that we're going to have to look at. Uh, we talked a little bit before about data. And I think, it, you know, as we start moving into a public, where, where public blockchains start uh, acquiring more and more information more and, and acquiring more and more valuable, the more and more value, um, the movement will go from those who have the data to those who can leverage the data most effectively. Like I'm really enamored with a project called Ocean Protocol, for example, where you're able to upload unique data sets and every time they're queried, you get compensated for that. So I see a scenario where people will, at some point, and again, we're, we're so early in this thing, and it's tough because you want it, I at least want it here very quickly, but I think you're going to start seeing scenarios where people will say, well, I could give all my data to Nest, 
or I can get this thermostat for free and then get paid for the data that I'm syncing up with this open source protocol. And eventually people say, well, why, why would I give them th that data for free when I can get compensated for the data that I'm getting over here? So that will move to a scenario where we all have access to the data and then it's who can get insight from that data really quickly, which is why I, for one, am like super fascinated by how AI sits on top of public blockchains because I think if you're a marketer in the future, you're going to need to understand how AI sits on top of this. But AI is not just about the tech, it's what questions do you ask. And so I think it's, and if you talk to data scientists, they will tell you it's not about the tech. You have to understand how data works, how to look for the insights in the data. But as more and more data moves out, and again, I mean, Google, the Fangs, and all those guys have a big um, head start for sure. But as the value proposition towards, I mean, in the last panel, we were talking about the, the clarity of the value proposition, which considering how much time I spend with the crypto startups, I can definitely uh, reiterate the point that it's not there yet and we need to work on it. Part of it is we still have to figure it out. Um, as that value proposition becomes clear, if you get paid over here, you don't get paid over here and people start doing it, and more importantly, their friends start doing it, then you're gonna start creating advantages. Um, similarly, I think we're gonna see an acceleration of the customer experience wars that essentially social media began, you know, uni from United Bricks Guitars on 2008 to United dragging that guy off the plane last year, you know, this has been the era where basically companies and brands are held accountable for customer experience at every single touch point. I mean, that was Sprinkler's business in some respect. Now, as the switching costs and the friction of moving from protocols or moving from applications becomes even less because of self-sovereign identity and data and all that stuff, um, the, the challenge or the, the, um, the, the competition for customer attention, for customer loyalty will be pushed more and more to how well do you understand what experience your customers or your prospects are actually looking for. So I think really starting to think about what does a CX really mean holistically um, is gonna be really, really fascinating to watch. Um, we talked about supply chains a little bit uh, before. I happen to think that you know the VP of supply chain and the VP of marketing are gonna be best friends. Like I'm a huge coffee drinker. That's probably pretty obvious at this point in the presentation. Um, but one of the things I tell people is if you walk into a store and you see two bags of coffee and they both say organic family owned farm in Nicaragua or whatever, <clears throat> you have no way of knowing who's telling the truth or if there is truth, right? But imagine a scenario where you pull out your phone and you can see the entire history of you know, that entire that coffee bean all the way back to the Rodriguez family in Nicaragua or whatever, whereas the other brand can't provide that provenance, then people start buying with their values. And don't tell me, like the, I did take issue with like, it's all about the money. I'm not arguing that people are incentivized by money, but I, I will argue that that's not the only thing they're incentivized by. They're incentivized by values. They're incentivized by, by, by sort of emotions, right? And if you, if you need any, I live in Washington, D.C. area. I like to call it ground zero for the twilight zone. Um, but, you know, if you don't believe that people align by values, like, I don't know where you've been for the last two years or so. People definitely align by values. So I think you're going to start seeing uh, brands, and they're already moving in this direction very subtly now. They're going to say, you know, these are the things we value. We want to prove that we, you know, support family-owned farms, or we organic, or we're, you know, hire women or minorities, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. And we can prove that claim with blockchain-based data that becomes an enhancer to your overall marketing value proposition. And I think people will start saying, yo, I will pay a premium for this. I will align myself behind that because these things are important to me. And so that claim without proof are just claims to me is, is those days of marketers just saying whatever the hell we want. I mean, that's what I've been doing for the last 20 minutes. Those days are basically going away. So fortunately, there's no blockchain for me just yet, uh, hopefully. So there's that. Uh, I think we've talked about you know, monetizing trust. One of the things that I think is really interesting is how much money marketers spend to activate uh, you know, their audiences versus how much money they actually spend on securing that information. And I think what's really cool to watch is like when, if we move into a decentralized identity solution with like a Peer Mountain or a, you know, a Uport or a MetaMask or a Civic or something like that, that becomes really powerful for brands who can de-risk their, you know, on their insurance premiums, they can, uh, they can, you know, de-risk sort of the PII, the GDPR stuff, all that. And now we'll start seeing how can we, how will brands be able to monetize 
uh, the relationship they have, the ability to offer credentials, the relationships. Yes, he's a certified Nike, you know, athlete or whatever. That will be a valuable thing that can then be marketed and 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 paid for throughout uh, throughout the ecosystem. Uh, and then finally, I think if you're a CMO, if you're a marketer, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to leverage the smart contracts to reduce frictions. I mean, the simple example I always use is just an oracle to, to prove whether your SEO firm is doing their job or not and then eliminate all those back office functions. I mean, just the amount of time with accounts payable, accounts receivable, all of that is just painful. Uh, I think you'll start seeing that happen. So I think you'll start seeing costs get lower on that side. And then I think what will be really cool down the road is where there are tools sitting on top of tokens that allow marketers to experiment with incentivization and, 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 and uh, you know, programming tokens based on certain criteria and setting up parameters for tests based on geography or demographics or whatever in order to test to sort of see what happens. But to, to remove that from sort of the back office and just give people the tools to do that on their own, that will be really, really cool so that you, as a marketer, you don't have to, uh, as a sort of a senior marketer, marketing leader, you don't have to approve all of these things. You can set the brand messaging sort of guidelines uh, on the token and then empower your field people, what have you, to run tests within their own geography with the confidence or within their own domain with the confidence that there, there are certain rules that they just can't, you know, we know that this token cannot be used to buy porn or Nazi paraphernalia or what have you. Um, the last the last panel actually made me worried about this slide because I don't know if I'm right or I'm wrong, so feel free to ping me. But my hypothesis is how does, how does crypto and, and really penetrate the enterprise? So my hypothesis is that it follows the pattern of everything else that's penetrated the enterprise, which is it doesn't not start at the top because you have to spend all this time getting approval from everybody and talking to your finance people, whatever. I think somebody's going to go in and say, you know what? These to ad tech, you know, looks good enough for me. My boss is cool with it. I'm going to go buy $1,000 or $5,000, something that's going to get hidden on an expense report that no one's really going to pay attention. I'm going to buy a couple thousand dollars worth of tokens, start running my own tests. You know, at the high level, sure, you, you're going to work on it, but you don't need to worry about all that governance and financial stuff. You'll just have people start running their tests and then eventually you'll bubble up and say, hey, look, it's already working over here. Now we can formalize it. So my hypothesis, and feel free to you know shout me out or tweet out and tell people how stupid I am. You wouldn't be the first, but you can definitely keep adding to that. Um, I think you'll start seeing the BYO crypto, bring your own crypto, which followed bring your own device, bring your own social, bring your own cloud. That's how social got in the enterprise is people just started managing Twitter, managing Facebook on their own, and then you needed the enterprise tools. So my hypothesis, and I'll be interested to hear from you guys over the next you know, six, 12 months, uh, is that, that you're going to see that, especially as these, you know, everything we talked about today uh, mat uh, matures. So basically, when, I, when all said and done and I think about us, it's okay, great, what are you going to do? A couple of things. I think if you're a marketer and you're thinking about what does your career look like, assuming you're not retiring in the next six months, I think there are a couple things to have to think about. So on the soft skill side, as you can see, I think it's that curiosity. If the data is available for everybody, it's how do you understand what questions to ask so you can get the insights, so you can deliver the customer experience, you can create the loyalty. I think the integrity becomes non-negotiable, right? You, you have to just work on the assumption that the, your, your customer expectations will get to the point that I can inspect all of your claims, and if you can't back up your claims, it's going to be a, com a competitive disadvantage for you. I think the empathy feeds directly into the customer experience, so that's on the soft skill side. On the hard skill side, the only, the only thing I make my children do every single day is I make them practice their coding. I use code.org, Code Academy, I make them practice their coding because they say, I think you don't, it's one thing to understand you know, uh, that the technology works or how to use the technology. It's understand how, how it actually works underneath the hood. That gives you an entirely new range of capabilities as marketing becomes a much more sort of intertwined with the technological functions, AI we talked about, and then I think token economics and understanding, and I think Ken made a great point. You do not have, in my opinion, he's right, you cannot have public blockchains without crypto tokens connected to it. It just doesn't work for me. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but that's my hypothesis. And in order to thrive in that world, because you're gonna, I think you're going to see two things happen. Phase one, we're starting to already see happen, which is where private blockchains sit, which is existing enterprises saying, okay, how do we take this new thing to do what we already do better, faster, cheaper? 
awesome. You should totally do that. Fantastic. But it's not enough. And it reminds me of the late 90s. I don't know if there anyone remembers the late 90s where like for a good 12 months, there was a rage about the power of corporate intranets. Corporate intranets were going to change the world. They didn't. They're cool, but they didn't change the world because what changed the world is the open public internet. And I think that's where the risk for large companies or any company is recognizing it's not just about how do we do our existing processes better, faster, cheaper. It's what are the things that are now possible that were previously impossible. A decentralized autonomous organization 10 years ago was impossible. Now it's possible. It's early. It's not quite ready for prime time, but it's possible. Paying people with smart contracts 10 years ago, not possible, now possible. So I think you have to be aware of what are the things that are emerging while you're focused on these private blockchain sort of corporate intranet equivalents. And that's where I think token economics fits in. Now, I tell people, look, token economics has got a lot going on. It's got game theory. It's got behavioral economics. It's got mechanism design. It's got all kinds of stuff going on. I can understand it can be overwhelming. But you can understand it because if you go to this link, you can listen to a 10-minute podcast where I explain token economics to my nine-year-old, and she gets it. So if my nine-year-old can understand token economics, pretty much anyone else can. Now, granted, I have the smartest nine-year-old on the planet, and she reads the Wall Street Journal every single day, but she's still nine. Actually, now she's 10, but she's basically nine. So there you go. She was nine at the time. So, and she's cute. So you should definitely go listen to that. And she, she always likes watching her SoundCloud views. You know, she's a marketer in training like all my children are. So there you go. Um, so to sort of address all of this, uh, what, what we've done is basically said, okay, there are two groups of people. There are people on the enterprise side and there are people on the vendor side. And everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. And now that I've been in this space for two years, I said, you know what? There are a couple things that enterprise buyers are going to need in order to make sense. Number one is they're going to need to understand what does the landscape look like. You saw sort of the first version, couple versions of the landscape. You need to understand what's going out there, who are the players. So that's why we're building out this entire sort of profile. It's the thing of it like, Yelp pages for each of the uh, uh, um, you know, crypto MarTech vendors out there. Then you need to be able to say, well, who's right for me based on what I need? So we've actually been working with some of the leading uh, blockchain, uh, um, uh, or sort of the lead blockchain people at Fortune 500 brands to basically get from them, here's how we're going to assess this. So we're building an assessment that allows uh, enterprise customers or enterprise brands to essentially score themselves, rank them, say, OK, based on my company, our needs, here's what we look for, and then allow you to use that information to line up with the various players in the field. Because there are a lot of worthwhile projects out there, but they may not be right for you at a particular stage. So the second stage is, it's almost like I call it decentralized Gartner and Forrester, but don't tell them yet, because I don't want them to get wind of it. Um, but Essentially, how do I know who's right for me? What are the rankings? And we're going to try to do it in a what I call a crypto first way. So you have more transparency, more understanding, and more value that the ratings that you're seeing are actually verified by people who you trust as opposed to sort of behind the scenes of people who work at the analyst firm. And then the third part is, if you're interested in getting your hands dirty with working with these technologies, uh, we have this accelerator uh, service that essentially you can use and sort of work in sort of a sandbox environment and say, okay, how would I use a crypto loyalty or a blockchain-based loyalty program? How would I use it for ad tech? What could I do? You know, how would I do a potentially one of those solutions? So we're trying to put this together in order to help the vendors in the space uh, understand the enterprise needs better, as well as the enterprise needs, uh, the enterprise is, the enterprises in the space um, understand how to make sense of what's going on based on the fact that we're spending our time sort of deep in the weeds, I like to say out on the frontiers with the crypto barbarians, but that doesn't always work so well, but basically working with the people doing the innovation. So if you are interested in more, uh, this was the book, this is the second book I put out. I uh, put it out last summer. Um, this is where uh, the CMOs of NASDAQ and Dun & Bradstreet did two things. One, uh, they said blockchain was important. And two, they said Jeremy's not a total moron. So that was good. Uh, so this is about a 70-page booklet and also has contributions from like Med AdChain and MadHive and a whole bunch of the early players in the space offering their view of how does the function of marketing evolve because of the arrival 
of, of blockchain technology. So this was my effort to think, how does it affect advertising and loyalty and data management and customer experience and hiring and all these types of things. So feel free, there's, there's some stuff in there. I definitely do not have all the answers, but it's my effort to sort of uh, put some thoughts together. So that's the first one. And if you're really interested in going down, um, this is the one I put out uh, back in April, Decentralized Marketing Organization, which is how do you build a marketing organization that's decentralized from the get-go? Like, there's no chief marketing officer. It's all decentralized, and innovation is pushed to the edges. So it's a little bit out there, um, but it talks about token uh, incentives and sort of game theory and all that type of stuff in order to drive those results. So um, this was actually the first one I put out called Blockchains in the Mainstream, which aggregates 33 of the biggest names in the blockchain industry. Uh, across multiple verticals, multiple geographies. Mul I mean, some of the biggest names like Roger Ver and Eric Voorhees and Jeff Garzik and Joel Manegro. I mean, like literally the who's who of blockchain is in this book just offering their views. And this is, Bitcoin was $700 when we put this thing out and there's still a ton of value in there. So this is a great primer for anyone new to the blockchain space. It's also great, oh, sorry, there was a, Nyax was also in my book. I apologize, my, that was not cool of me. Sorry, man, I owe you a beer. Yeah, exactly. I owe you a beer. It's outside. Um, <clears throat> uh, but there's a lot of stuff in there. So if you, all of these are free downloads. I didn't even ask for your email address. So just go get it, download it. It's off and running. So um, the one thing I'll, I say to everybody when I talk to Fortune 1000 audiences, like, look, at the end of the day, this stuff is immature. We don't, aside from arguably the Bitcoin blockchain, there's not a lot of proof at scale. The standards as we talked about is a total mess. Uh, totally, I feel bad for the enterprises because you just get hammered by all sides with these totally fragmented offerings and then people like me just adding to the hype. So I apologize for that. But uh, with that said, I know we're waiting for happy hour. I want to thank you guys. I have all the contact information. Please feel free. We are all in this thing together. I really look forward to your thoughts, your feedback, and your comment. I'm grateful to the opportunity to IAB to present. And um, I think it's time for happy hour, right? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Or do we have one question or two? Any questions? Time for or questions. Comments? Nobody? Oh, yes, sir. I'm not sure I would agree with you that there was no Google and, or Yahoo in the offline world. But. My point is that, you know, it was a, from a consumer standpoint, it was such a drastic change in how you consume information. It was faster and so on, right? With blockchain, if there are five top companies which are 4.5 trillion dollar market cap, can they derail this vision? Right? In your opinion, is this a document? Oh, you mean because there's Google and Facebook? Comparable that there is enough you know, money, knowledge, you know, oh. smart stuff. So, first of all, um, that's an excellent question, which is why I'm giving you this amazing book from National Grave called The Greeks. And why the reason why I'm giving you this book called The Greeks is because, I'll tell you why, <laughs> they, they basically invented democracy in its pure decentralized form. And if you go back to ancient Greece, I think you're going to see a lot of commonalities here of how we do this at scale. So congratulations, you win that. Um, and my friend wrote it, and it's really, really good. It's going to help you. So the answer is maybe. Here's how I think about this. We are all in the, um, of the mindset that we almost still view the, the fangs as like the disruptors or whatever, but these are big companies now. They're slower, I mean, they move quickly relatively to like Sears Roebuck, for sure, but they're still big companies. Getting them to sort of reinvent their business models while they're executing on their current business model is, is historically very, very challenging to do. So, it's not that they don't understand it. I just don't know if you could get Zuckerberg or, and Larry and Sergey to basically say, okay, well, we're going to forget our entire existing advertising model. We're going to invert our style, decentralize, offer a token to everybody, and we're just going to tell our shareholders that's going to work. Theoretically possible. I'm just skeptical. So, you know, these guys are huge for sure, and it's going to take a while, especially because of the data advantage that they have. And maybe the naive Don Quixote in me says, you know what, somebody from all this, you know, all of those people on the landscape, all the people sitting up here, they're not stupid. And if you try enough of them, like this is almost like the way nature works, you dandelions, human reproduction, you put enough sort of 
efforts at this, one, all you need is one. So that combined with the better trust, improved transparency, immutability, paying people for value, respecting people, giving opportunities in a permissionless, in a, you know, oper in a permissionless sort of environment, it just, to me, and it could be me believing my own bullshit, which I do a lot, just says it's inevitable that somebody's gonna figure out how to do that. I mean, you could go to pre-search right now. Go to pre-search and every time you search there, you get the same results you get by going to Google, but you get paid in pre-tokens. And those tokens are gonna be redeemed for stuff that you can buy. And those merchants are gonna use those tokens to pay for advertising. It's about as simple an example of a circular economy as you can find. And instead of Google capturing the value, you're capturing the value, you're getting rewarded for it in pre-tokens. Disclosure, I work with them. So I, I could just not tell you that, but that would be a clam, I'm telling But it's real, the reason I work with them is because it's so damn cool. So I think, yes, you're gonna see it because there's so much value on this. And like, I just, some days I feel like I'm a total idiot, but then I look at people like Fred Wilson, Zuka Wilcox, Vitalik Buter, and I'm like, well, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong with these guys. And I'm like, I can live with that. So. I look at the pieces, it just seems like that's gonna work. So is it, hopefully that's a respectable answer to your question, plus you want a book, so now you're happy. <laughs> yes, sir. Here's what I tell all the Yes. It's an awesome question. The answer I say is, you don't care that SMTP is the protocol that makes your email work. All you need to know is email is faster than faxing. You don't care that blockchain is the way that value is gonna shift around the world. All you need to know is now, when you send money to another country, instead of, this happened to me last week, I got paid $500 from someone in the UK. When all was said and done through the traditional wire transfer, I had $429 in my bank. I got paid $500 from someone in Switzerland, I got paid in Ether, and when all of a sudden done, I had $499.96 in my wallet. So tell me, which one, if you're an international business person, are you going to do more often? My new deal is when people work with me internationally, I said, I will not work with you if you don't pay, with, pay me in crypto. No deal. Like, it's that simple. Why would I do this when I can do this? You don't care. You're not gonna care that it's blockchain. All you need to know is I'm keeping whatever, $70.95 more than I would over here. And that's a PayPal, all these things. Doesn't matter, you don't need to know how it works. You need to know that it works. I'll give you an example. Like I was, my mom was here last year. And I was discussing with a friend of mine to transfer some money to him in India. And he was like, <clears throat> After the conversation, she's like, why don't you just use Bitcoin? I said, like, what the hell do you know about Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, I saw it on TV. I read about it. And, uh, and, and I, ma I made her buy like half a Bitcoin. Nice. And this was like when it was 1,000 something. <laughs> yeah, the remittance. I mean, I feel terrible. My cleaning lady is from El Salvador. And I mean, I'm sure many of you know this. Like when she sends money back, like $50 on Western Union, it's like a $13 fee. The person who can least afford to pay a $13 fee is paying a $13. That's ridiculous. It's offensive. You know, if you really care about making people better off, like, you should be, like, demanding that they pay, you know, that they offer crypto. And that's what we're working on. We actually have a really cool thing that Carlos is working on the South Bronx where he's empowering people who are underbanked or unbanked to be able to use crypto not only within their own economy locally but also be able to remit it back to, you know, the DR or Costa Rica or any other place for that matter. So that's the value. The value is you can give more, more keep people keep more of their value, it's faster, and you know, it's yours. It's not sitting in a bank account where it's like, oh, well, we gotta examine KYC you or whatever. Now I'm not anti-regulation, trust me, but I want people to be able to control more of their wealth, especially people who are most vulnerable. Sorry, man, I just get super passionate about it's also the end of the day. Any other questions? I'm running out of swag is the only problem. Oh, big shout out to Aaron for the coaching on the deck version two. Thanks, man, for that. Anybody else? All right, happy hour. Thank you, man, I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone.